thank you for inviting me to this bizarre way of giving a talk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by the way, my dad's an artist, and this painting here is one of his. I'm sitting in my dining room. So, what I'm going to do tonight um, is tell you my story. Um, and it's basically a story, I think, and if you probably know the, the rudiments of it, I was born, or I developed um, esotropia, alternating esotropia, um, in the very first months of life. And I had three childhood surgeries at the ages of two, three, and seven, but the surgeries did not really change my vision. I still remained cross-eyed and stereo-blind. That is until the age of 48, when I uh, consulted with Dr. Therese Ruggiero, a developmental optometrist, in Northampton, Massachusetts, near where I live, and I undertook optometric vision therapy. And I cannot tell you how transformative that experience was, how transformative, how remarkable, how joyful it was. The changes in my vision were just extraordinary. And because of that, I decided um, to research the whole issue of strabismus and the um, treatments that are used for it fairly thoroughly. And that led to a number of different things. It led to Oliver Sacks writing a story about me called Stereo Sue. And it led to me um, eventually writing my own book called Fixing My Gaze. And in the course of trying to understand for business, really the first thing I had to understand was what is the primary role of vision? What do you think the primary role of vision is? Can I get some answers from the <laughs> group of you? <laughs> <laughs> so you're all going to be optometrists someday. <laughs> so, let's think about it. I, I would say that it was trying to understand the primary role of vision. Once I understood that, then I could begin to understand why I developed esotropia and why the vision therapy was so effective in treatment. So, in order to think about the fundamental role of vision, one way you can approach this problem, because it's stymied all of you, because you, in, in some sense we all take our vision for granted. So, maybe one way to understand the primary role of vision is to learn from people who are going blind and are losing their vision. And along those lines, I wanted to mention to you a book called, can you see it? Touching the Rock by John Hall. Has anyone read this book? It's extraordinary. It's a book about a man who um, always had vision problems and eventually lost his vision in middle age. And you would think a story like this would be, you know, really depressing to read, but it's not. It's incredibly illuminating. He's a beautiful writer. And in the course of reading this book, kind of come up with some ideas of what is the fundamental role of vision. So I'm going to read to you a passage from Touching My Rock, Touching Rock. And in this passage, John Hall, at this point, has gone completely blind. And he's sitting on a park bench in a busy park, listening to his four or five children running around all around him. And this is what he says. He says, the strange thing about it, however, is that it was a world of nothing but action. Every sound was a point of activity. Where nothing was happening, there was silence. That little part of the world then died, disappeared. The ducks were silent. Had they gone? Nobody was walking past me just now. This meant that the footpath itself had disappeared. The world of being, the silent, still world where things simply are, that was not true. Well, if you think about that, John Hall could have gotten up from the park bench and used his cane and used his hearing to sort of understand better where he was in the world. But all of us can do this much more quickly. We simply open our eyes and look around. Because the fundamental role of vision is to let us know where we are in space and where other things are in space so that we can move and so that we can manipulate objects. That's the fundamental role of vision. 
And once I understood that, then I could begin to understand my own strabismus, my adaptations to it, and why the vision therapy treatments were so effective. Okay? So we're going to do a few demonstrations today, and I can see you all. So I can see who's going to be doing the, the demonstration. So try to get higher up on this chair so that you can see more of my face. So I'm sitting on two books now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting on my own book and now I'm touching the rock. <laughs> okay. So here's the first experiment I want you to do. Or think about. How is it we know where we are in space? Well, if we were a cyclops, and here's a picture of a cyclops. I had to look really hard in the web, on the web, to find a picture of a cyclops that wasn't completely disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine you're a cyclops. You've got one eye in the middle of your forehead. You know what's straight ahead of you because that one eye is pointing straight ahead. You know what's to the right of you because you have to turn the one eye to the right to see whatever is to the right, and so on. But we don't have one eye. We have two eyes. And that makes our vision both more sophisticated but also more complicated. So here's the first experiment. I want you to just take your index finger, hold it a comfortable distance from your face like six or eight inches or something, and I want you just to look at it. Now I'm going to ask you this. Is either one of your eyes, you're looking straight ahead. You're looking straight ahead at your finger. Is either one of your eyes looking straight ahead? No. Your right eye is looking a little to the left, and your left eye is looking a little to the right. So what is it exactly straight ahead? What is straight ahead? Looking in the distance, where the line of sight of your two eyes crosses. Now, we're all, you all give it a piece of paper that looks like this. You'll see 
let's say for the teddy bear, that um, the um, place where the image of the teddy bear falls on the right and left retina is the same number <coughs> to the right of the photograph for both sides. And again, your brain can say, well, I have two images of the teddy bear, one for my right and one for my left eye, but they're falling on corresponding retinal points, and therefore there is only one teddy bear, and it's located only in one place in space. You guys can all go hand with me. Yep, yep. Okay, because kind of sounds like a little bit stuff. Okay, so that all works perfectly as long as your two eyes are pointing to the same place in space at the same time. Well, what happens if you have stupidness? And that doesn't happen. So I have here a picture of myself as a little baby, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but um, I'm basically soft side. My parents say from the moment I was born, from what I've read, Eustotopia developed uh, within the first three months of life, but whatever, I think it has been cross eyed all my life. And um, so that meant my two eyes were not pointing at the same place at the same time. And there are really two, three important consequences of that. One is visual confusion, a second is diplopia, and a third is um, stereo blindness. So we're going to start by thinking about Confusion, visual confusion. It's actually a term that was coined by Helmholtz, the same he invented the ophthalmoscope, a very famous philosopher, biophysicist, Renaissance man. Um, the term is actually kind of a visual confusion because the word confusion is such a generic word. But he had a specific meaning for it, and that meaning can be um, sort of worked out by looking at that second picture on your sheet of paper, the one that lives in the and confusion. Okay? So here again, if you look at that part of the picture, and you look, let's say, at the rattle, you'll see that the, if you follow the line of sight of the rattle, you'll see that if you follow it to the left eye, the left phobia, that the, the rattle image falls on the phobia of the left eye. You all see that? Yeah. Now, the right eye is turned in. This person has a right eye eutrophia. And as a result, it's the block, the image of the block that falls on the phobia of the right eye because of the eye turn. So the brain may say, well, I see a block and I see a rattle. And they both fall on the phobia of one or the other eye, so therefore they must be in the same place in space. And so you may see the block and the rattle superimposed, as is shown in that diagram. Okay? And that's visual confusion. Now, it may seem to you, well, that's a bizarre experience. I can't imagine it. But we can all experience visual confusion using the hole in the hand demonstration. And uh, this is a great demonstration to do. use with your friends, so might as well learn it. So what I want you to do is take that same piece of paper, the one that has the um, pictures on it, and I want you to hold it the piece of the size of a color picture. And then you And then go ahead and look at me again. With the other hand, take your left hand, take your palm toward you. Put the um, left hand up against the um, far end of the tube. Not so it covers the tube. Not like this, but like this. So it's next to the tube. And then open both eyes and tell me what you do. What did you see? 
Did you see a hole in your hand? Was anyone in pain? <laughs> so, do you see how that's an example of visual confusion? Because one eye, the right eye, is looking for the tube, so the hole, essentially, is falling on the central part of the retina of that right eye. The other um, eye, the left eye, can't see the tube, it sees the palm of your hand. So the central part of that retina is involved as being an image of the palm of your hand. And as a result, the brain puts the two together and says, well, then the hole in the tube and the hand must be in the same place and you end up seeing a hole in the hand. That's the confusion. And that's probably a more difficult phenomenon for somebody with the business to deal with than double vision. Because you really don't know where things are located in this case. And one thing I want to emphasize with you is that when I was a child learning to read, and this was after two and after first grade, after three operations, I experienced quite a bit of visual confusion, and it really made it difficult to learn to read. And I think this happens to a lot of children throughout the schools everywhere, and it's a problem that usually goes unnoticed. In part because a lot of kids may have problems coordinating their eyes for close up to near vision, even though their eyes are relatively straight from far away. I was manifestly cross eyed. I had had these surgeries. I was wearing glasses. And still, when I started to have problems with reading, the only person who thought of mine had something to do with my vision was my mother, and nobody was to her. So, when I was, um, was worst of, first starting to learn to read, Things looked blurry to me. And not just blurry, it was as if the letters moved around on the page, which is something I'm trying to show to you. Okay? And let's think about why that would be the case. It's a problem with visual confusion. When you're reading, ideally, your two eyes should be pointing at the same letter in the word, or at the same place on the page, right? So, for example, if these were my two eyes, and here's my name, Sue, Ideally, the two eyes would be, let's say, pointing to the same letter, the U in this case, as I was reading, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened to me was I was esotropic, which meant I crossed fixated. So the right eye was actually seeing further to the left than the left eye. And so, for something like this, Sue, one eye might have been seeing the U, and the other eye might have been 